we were talking before about the historical pre-cap-and-trade policies, and some of them made a distinction between new sources of pollution and old sources of pollution. So the first thing I want to talk about is this difference between old sources and new sources. When the Clean Air Act was originally passed, Congress wanted to give a break to currently existing polluters, and so they made the pollution uh, restrictions more onerous on new sources where you can use new technology and less strict, less stringent on currently existing plant and equipment. But Congress didn't define the words old and new. And this causes the following question. What happens if you decide to renovate half of an existing plant? After you do that, is the, the resulting plant that's half new and half old, does it go under the old rules, or uh, rules for o old plants or rules for new plants? And the, the EPA established a policy called New Source Review, which attempted to adjudicate when you classify something as a new plant and when you classify it as an old plant. For example, what if the rules said that if you renovated 10% or less of your plant, then the whole plant could go under the old rules? Well, what if you renovated 10% of the plant in one year, and another 10% in the next year, and another 10% in the next year, until in year 10, uh, none of the areas of the plant are more than 10 years old? But still, since each year you did it only 10%, does that mean that each year that, that, that you can still go under the old rules? It's a big controversy about New Source Review in the George W. Bush administration, and environmental groups sued because they felt that the Bush administration was being too lenient on companies in New Source Review. Then when the Obama administration came into office, the Obama administration changed the EPA's rules because you had a new uh, EPA administrator, and then the environmentalists were happy, but the private firms weren't happy. So this is one of the problems that comes about when Congress doesn't define words like old and new. Next topic is the first actual tradable permit scheme, which concerned coal-fired power plants in the U.S. Midwest. They emit sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain. And because of the direction of prevailing winds, lots of the acid rain was caused in eastern Canada. So the U.S. made an agreement with Canada to alleviate that, that pollution. And it decided to set up a tradable permit scheme in order to do so. And the idea was these, were, these are sophisticated agents. They're coal-fired power plants, so they have professional managers, they have uh, uh, lawyers, uh, they're not naive players, and so they should be able to figure out this new kind of way of regulating pollution. In terms of problems, though, in the first few years of the tradable permit scheme, there were very, very few trades, many fewer than economists had predicted. Economists thought everybody understands markets because economists understand markets. You have a supply curve and you have a demand curve, and some firms have high cost of pollution reduction, some firms have low cost of pollution reduction, so it should be rather easy for them to see that they're mutually beneficial gains, gains from trade and conduct trades. But trades didn't happen. And it seems like the reason is that the newness of this scheme made firms very wary of participating in it. If they wanted to buy permits, they weren't sure what kind of price was going to be reasonable or were they going to be getting cheated by the firms that were selling permits. If they wanted to sell permits, same thing. They worried that they were going to sell the permits for a price that was unfairly low. There were no brokers or middlemen to get the buyers and sellers, the potential buyers and sellers, together. And so there was a lot of fear and 
almost no trades in the beginning. Now, after a while, and so here comes the successes, after a while, people got more comfortable with this scheme. The trades started occurring, and after five or six years, everything that the economists predicted uh, that would, would occur in terms of the the volume of trades and the resulting decreases in total abatement costs for the industry as a whole, those did start to happen. So eventually it was a success, most people say, but it took a while to get started. So our next topic, how about objections of environmentalists to tradable permit schemes? Tradable permit schemes were very unpopular in the environmental community in the beginning. Uh, the kind of rhetoric that you heard were things like, this enables rich polluters to pollute as much as they want just by paying for it. So it doesn't make pollution an evil thing to do anymore. It's just a cost of doing business. And the biggest, richest firms will find it easiest to incur that cost of doing business and so you'll get a lot of pollution. And these objections were quite fervent until I would say the late 1990s and early 2000s. And the thing that really changed this was the last thing I want to talk about in this video, the Kyoto Protocol and what happened around its it's uh, going into force. So the Kyoto Protocol was an international treaty negotiated in the late 1990s when uh, Bill Clinton was president and his vice president Al Gore went to Japan to Kyoto to take part in the negotiations. It was the first treaty concerning greenhouse gas emissions. The treaty said it wouldn't go into effect until it was ratified by enough countries. And the definition of enough was enough large polluters, enough large historical emitters of greenhouse gases. So countries like Japan, the US, Canada, the Western European countries, Russia, you had to have enough of these large polluters to sign on, to ratify, before it would go into effect. Until it went into effect, it wasn't binding on anybody. The Clinton administration brought the treaty to the U.S. Senate. It was rejected overwhelmingly. I don't remember now what the vote was, something like 97 to nothing. So it was clear the United States was not going to ratify it. And then when George W. Bush became president, even more clear that the United States was not going to ratify it because the president didn't, wasn't in support of it anymore. Russia, you might remember, was just going through the transition from the Soviet Union to a capitalist system. The Russian economy had shrunk a great deal during the 1990s. There was large economic dislocations, extremely high unemployment, decreasing life expectancy. And the attitude of the Russian government was that, the, that limiting greenhouse gas emissions was going to cause economic pain and they were already suffering enough economic pain, so they weren't going to do it. So although Canada, Western European countries, and Japan ratified the treaty, nobody thought it would ever go into effect because the US and Russia clearly weren't going to do it, and so there weren't going to be enough countries, enough big polluters doing it, so that it would never actually go into effect. It would never be binding on anybody. And then what happened is, uh, shortly after uh, the, the year 2000, the Russian legislature, the Russian Duma, took another look at the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol had a tradable permit scheme in it. Countries were going to be grandfathered, and then if a country didn't want to use all its permits, it could sell the permits to other countries that did. And what the Duma then realized is that because the Russian economy had shrunk so much since the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia actually was polluting much less than it was in 1990, and the grandfathering year was approximately 1990, was still when the Soviet Union existed. 
So if the Kyoto Protocol were to go into effect, then Russia would have a whole bunch of extra permits that it had been grandfathered that it would be able to sell on the open market to countries like the U.S. and and uh, and Japan and countries in in Western Europe, and this would be a money maker for Russia. So that completely changed their mind, and they decided to ratify the treaty. It went into effect. And so the only reason why the Kyoto Protocol actually went into effect was because of the tradable permit scheme that was in it. Environmentalists realized this, and this, I think, is what finally changed the minds of almost all of them in terms of tradable permit schemes, from being opponents of tradable permit schemes to seeing that tradable permit schemes can actually be pretty useful and that they they shouldn't they shouldn't oppose them any further. <laughs>